Everywhere you look around, there's a company connected to a logo, whether big or small. And today, we're going to get into the origins of Halloween. It's coming. There's no escape. On Halloween, the veil between this world and the next will lift. And then, all hell breaks loose. People have been scaring each other for as long as there's been a Halloween. But how long is that? Where does it come from? And why do we put on disguises and carve jack-o'-lanterns? To indulge our darkest fears? Unlocking the secrets of Halloween means discovering how it all began thousands of years ago. So lock the doors, dim the lights, and don't be scared as we dig up the real story of Halloween. How can you describe Halloween without sounding insane? Masked children come to our doors and threaten us. In return, we give them candy. But why? Why do we carve faces into fruit, then light candles inside them? And why do we adorn our homes with coffins and tombstones? The truth is, we take great pleasure in scaring ourselves to death. Halloween is about being someone else. It's about getting outside your own skin. And I think we tolerate it because we know it's one night. This impulse to confront our fears of life and of death and make sport of them, it's ancient. And so are our treasured Halloween traditions. When did Halloween begin? And its ancient origins go back to the old Celtic calendar. And the old Celtic tribe divided the year between a light half and a dark half. And uh, Samhain, their ancient holiday, was a precursor to our Halloween. It was the beginning of the dark half. Thousands of years ago, the Celts, one of Europe's early tribes, celebrated their Samhain harvest festival with bonfires on the night of October 31st to welcome their new year. For ancient peoples, harvest was a matter of life and death. If crops failed, people starved. Death was always close. It was a bit of a warning. You know, it's going to get cold and dark. Gather together, come home, and don't send anybody out alone in the dark. But the Celts believed there was even more to Samhain. What marked Samhain and this transition from light to dark was that time and space became permeable, flexible. And so that spirits, not only of the dead, but of the past or of other realities could sort of wander into our reality and humans could wander out and get lost in the other world as well. The veil between life and death was at its thinnest and the living and the dead could commingle. And that's at the, the root of all the Halloween celebrations. Stories persist of people on Samhain night getting trapped in the other world and of the dead appearing among the living. But the truth is, we know precious little about Samhain. We can only guess that their bonfires likely drew one familiar Halloween icon, a thing familiar yet frightening to many, the bat. Before there was electricity, the only way you would have seen a bat would have been by the firelight. And in fact, you probably would have seen it around the fire because bats eat insects and insects are attracted to the light. Many, many cultures sort of set aside a day or a couple of days to ritually celebrate and recognize the dead. An interesting thing is that you find a lot of them at about the same time period, especially in agricultural societies, because if you think about it, you know, spring things come up out of the ground, they're very green, you harvest in the middle of the summer. And towards the fall, and when it gets towards winter, things die. 
How did these ancient traditions survive into our modern era? In Western culture, they were preserved by, of all people, Christians. In a bizarre twist of history, as Christianity spread, it adopted and reimagined pagan folk ways rather than try to stamp them out. This made it easier to convert pagans. A key pagan festival destined to get a Christian makeover was Lemuria, when celebrants placated the dead, culminating on May 13th. Of all the different days that they have in the Roman calendar to celebrate the dead, it was the spookiest. So on the Lemuria, what are called the larvae, the ghosts of the departed would come up um, and haunt people. To quell the dead, pagan Romans poured milk onto their graves or offered them little cakes. But the church co-opted Lemuria in 609 AD, turning May 13th into All Saints Day, a day to honor the most holy of dead Christians. Setting aside this day uh, was an attempt to Christianize this very pagan festival, and yet at the same time what it did was it, it kept a lot of the same themes going. The Christianized version of Lemuria was such a success that church leaders made a decision that eventually gave rise to Halloween. They moved All Saints, or Hallows Day, to November 1st to drain the life out of pagan Samhain. Because Samhain fell on the night of October 31st, before All Hallows Day on November 1st, people started calling Samhain All Hallows Evening the evening before All Hallows Day. This shortened into All Hallows Even, and finally, into Halloween. And then, to be safe, the church went one step further, adding a holiday to honor not just saints, but everyday Christians. November 2nd became All Souls Day, a church-sanctioned holiday to honor the departed. This is real important for Halloween because this is where Halloween gets its association with dead souls, death, and the supernatural again. So thank the church for inspiring the creepy essentials of Halloween. But wait, there's more. The church also helped establish the tradition of trick-or-treating, sort of. It all started during the Middle Ages on All Souls Day, when priests told Christians to pray for souls trapped between heaven and hell in a netherworld they called purgatory. Purgatory is not a pleasant place. It's not hell. It's not as bad as hell is, but it's still probably pretty fiery. Souls are kind of suffering there. Luckily, there is something that you could do. You could offer up prayers for them. How did souls get out of purgatory? According to the church, if enough prayers were offered, a soul would fly up into heaven. This led to a medieval custom that bears more than a striking resemblance to our modern trick-or-treat. Children would go souling, begging for soul cakes, spiced cakes filled with raisins. In return for these treats, the beggars would offer up prayers for souls trapped in purgatory. While this forerunner to trick-or-treat became a preoccupation for medieval Christians, so did another future essential of Halloween. Witches. It made perfect sense for people in medieval times to believe that there were demons and witches. And if there were demons and witches and they were responsible for bad things in the world, it made sense that you hunt them down and you kill them. That was their worldview. A witch panic in the 16th century helped establish the look of the character that, for many, epitomizes Halloween. Almost always women, witches, were seen as in league with Satan. They were probably the healers who had cures and folklore and passed down orally through generations. And at some point, that becomes very suspicious for whatever reason to the religious people around them. And a lot of the symbols that were associated with these women, who probably often lived alone, uh, may have been somewhat eccentric, of course, end up becoming associated with witches. Over time, 
As more and more women were accused of witchcraft, their practical kitchen tools acquired sinister dimensions and became model Halloween icons. Even something as mundane as a broom became an instrument of evil, as well as handy transportation. Another accessory in every witch's lair was perfect for brewing devilish potions, the cauldron. Cauldrons become very popular. Again, it was something that every household had in medieval ages. It was your basic cooking implement. The pointed witch's hat was a variation on a medieval country woman's hat. And of course, the mysterious lurking killer with the glowing eyes, the cat. It's not surprising that cats are associated with witches and Halloween. Cats can be a little enigmatic. Um, you don't really know what's going on in their head. Also, they used to hang out near the hearth and by the brooms, so they became associated with witchcraft and with Halloween. Black cats and witches, graveyards and ghosts, the spooky elements of America's great Gothic holiday were taking shape. These ghoulish icons would soon make their way to the new world, where they'd help create the extravaganza we know today. Death that makes this holiday, whether it's the threat of death if there is a bad harvest, the end of one order or the beginning of a new, this idea of the endless cycle of life and death and renewal is part of a lot of holidays, not, not just uh, Halloween. This period saw the continued influence of one of Halloween's most colorful icons, the mask. It often appeared in tandem with another Halloween tradition, destructiveness. Rowdy beggars at All Hallows' Eve also guzzled their share of alcohol, and demands for food and drink became more threatening. Masks helped hide their identities. In Britain, they got into some very particular forms that involved dressing in costumes and going house to house to present these little plays. And at the end of the performance, they would be rewarded with food and sometimes money. Was this trick or treat? Not quite, but the resemblance was there. In 17th century England, many of these customs survived only in rural areas, but they would soon turn up in the city streets thanks to a pro-Catholic terrorist named Guy Fawkes. On November 5th, 1605, Fawkes tried to blow up London's House of Lords with 36 kegs of gunpowder. Guy Fawkes was tried, found guilty, and hanged. And according to legend, his body was then drawn and quartered and the pieces were thrown into a fire. The next year, on the anniversary of the failed plot, and every year that followed, the children of London mocked the memory of Guy Fawkes by causing chaos in the streets, parading, begging, and building bonfires. Today, all over England, this is called Guy Fawkes Day, or Bonfire Night. Now, Guy Fawkes Day fell on November 5th, which is very close to Halloween, so a lot of the energy that was focused on Halloween sort of shifted toward Guy Fawkes Day. While it wasn't our Halloween yet, it had all the signs. Children and adults alike taking advantage of the darkness and letting loose. But would this pagan form of celebration make its way across the Atlantic to disrupt the sanctuary of the New World? Not if colonial Puritans had their way. For the Puritans of New England, the supernatural was a dark, menacing force, not a harmless superstition worthy of inspiring a holiday. Despite their efforts to kill the Halloween tradition before it took hold, there were a few Guy Fawkes celebrations that made their way to the shores of America. Other settlers tolerated or even embraced the traditions that threatened the Puritans and seeds were planted for the holiday that would morph into our American Halloween. For example, there's an 1833 description of a Halloween, not even so much a party, but just a small gathering where they told ghost stories around a fire. But now, 
one more spooky standby. The image of a spirit or ghost would join witches and skeletons in a macabre Halloween dance. By the mid-19th century, America was primed for a much darker holiday. Having endured four long years of civil war that ended in 1865 with over a half million dead. There were so many unclaimed, unknown dead bodies that the Civil War left behind that this country was obsessed with death. And mostly it was that so many of these soldiers died unknown. We don't know what happened to them. So there was a huge sense of they could come back. Maybe they're not dead. It makes perfect sense that people would tell more ghost stories. And the very first Halloween ghost stories were about people coming back home. It's at this time that America's Halloween story really begins. After the Civil War, when Scots and Irish immigrants brought their rural, old-world Halloween customs with them, they helped to establish even more American Halloween traditions. For the Scots, it was a little bit of a scarier night. Until fairly late, we're still talking about the appearance of bogies on Halloween. Bogies, or boogeymen, were sort of amorphous, pestering ghosts that plagued children, hiding under beds or tapping on windows, or lurking by a gate or turnstile. There was a belief that there was a bogey on every stile, which meant on Halloween night you could cross any gate and there might be something sitting there waiting to get you. Halloween's signature symbol, the jack-o'-lantern, also began as a European tradition. But the prototype wasn't carved from a pumpkin. There's a great legend about a character named Jack-o'-lantern. And Jack was a troublemaker. But he was so bad, he even managed to get himself thrown out of hell, which is not an easy thing to do. But the devil did decide to have pity on him and scooped up an ember from the fires of hell and gave it to him. So Jack takes the ember and he puts it inside a hollowed out turtle. And he walks around and that becomes the legend of Jack O'Lantern. In one age-old European practice, children would carve their own jack-o'-lanterns out of turnips and light them with candles. The first reference we have in the United States to jack-o'-lantern, it comes from Nathaniel Hawthorne, and he's writing in Twice Told Tales, and he's describing someone's very tattered coat full of holes, and when you hold it up to the light, it shines like a jack-o'-lantern would. Americans improved on the jack-o'-lantern tradition. They substituted big, round pumpkins for the old world's hard little turnips, and Halloween finally had its trademark. Pumpkins are generally harvested around Halloween, and kids realized jack-o'-lanterns could be a prankster's best weapon on Halloween night. Kids figured out this great thing they could do. They could take a pumpkin, and you could hollow it out, and you put a candle on it, and then you take that pumpkin and you put it on a stick and you put a sheet over it and you parade around you can put it in front of a window or something and it's really a pretty scary picture jack-o'-lanterns soon became the face of halloween but scots and irish immigrants also brought with them the more rambunctious stone-throwing prank-playing halloween reveling to america and on halloween night at the dawn of the 20th century there was a whole dark world of trouble just waiting for American boys. Halloween had been on a dark and scary journey from its origins with the Celts centuries ago. In the Middle Ages, it became a Christian holiday honoring the dead. But by the 16th century, it was turning into a rowdy kid's celebration marked by begging and pranks. By the 1800s, Halloween had even moved into cities and towns across America. But the ghastly face of Halloween was reimagined in gruesome shades of orange and black at the turn of the 20th century. For the first time, artists of the era brought together all things scary and linked them to Halloween. Skeletons and spiderwebs, jack-o'-lanterns and bats. They established the look of Halloween that we still use today. Among these icons are white-sheeted ghosts. 
The sheet that a ghost wears derives from uh, the winding sheet, the shroud that corpses were traditionally wrapped in before burial. And jack-o'-lanterns. The big grin still connotes the rictus of a death's head, as does the triangular nose hole. And even when it seems kind of jolly, death is still still lurking there in the imagery. Horned devils came from medieval depictions of Satan. And witches from witch-hunting hysteria that swept through Europe and Puritan America. Witches became very popular in the early part of the 20th century, which is why they naturally became linked to Halloween. But there's actually a change in the way we perceive witches. The witches of uh, the 19th century were old, they had big noses and there were warts. And the witches in the 20th century are actually it's kind of attractive. It makes Halloween just a little, not only scary, but also a little naughty. But even as Halloween was dressing its old customs in new costumes, it was also creating new traditions, bad ones. Was Halloween in the early 20th century getting out of hand? To the dismay of authorities and property owners, the answer was yes. It was whatever you could think of. There was a bunch of mischief. Back in those days, people had buggies. The bigger kids try to take a buggy and put it up on a haystack. And there's about a half a dozen of the guys, and they just kind of pushed and pushed it up the haystack. It was a lot of fun. Oh, we never did anything that was uh, really destructive. Mostly tricks. But for others, those tricks were more destructive. Pranks, usually committed by adolescent boys, plagued cities like Chicago and Philadelphia. By the 1920s, Halloween in America was turning into a crisis. Tricks on Halloween night were out of hand. The destructive pranks went beyond just smashing pumpkins. Kids would take bars of soap, and they'd put them in the rails for streetcars so that the streetcars would derail and people would actually get hurt. They would take the steps in front of people's doors and move them so when people walked outside, they would fall over and get hurt. They would set fires. They would throw stones through windows. I mean, this is really destructive stuff. In rural communities, Pranksters took wagons apart and reassembled them on roofs. They removed gates on farm fences so that animals could escape. This particular prank was so popular that in some places, the night before Halloween was called Gate Night. In other cities, it was Mischief Night or even Hell Night. Halloween pranks during the Great Depression may have been, in part, a product of the desperation of the time an excuse for troublemaking. But there was already trouble everywhere, and many communities couldn't afford to feed their own, much less clean up destructive messes. The Halloween of 1933 was actually labeled Black Halloween in a lot of newspapers because of all of the destruction that the cities incurred. The kids were no longer just doing innocent, silly things. Now they were smashing light bulbs. They were setting fire to buildings. They were smashing car windows. If Halloween were to survive, it would have to change. Schools and police departments and other civic groups consciously and very actively promoted the idea of taming Halloween. And so they started to invent all sorts of things for kids to do, to divert them. Townwide parties, costume contests, games, everything that you could think of to get the kids away from pulling tricks and into the light. Novelty companies like Denison and Beistel helped out these civic efforts. Denison published a series of Halloween guides called Bogey Books that suggested ways of turning Halloween from a prank night into a party night. Denison was one of the first companies that realized there was money to be made off of Halloween. They started to put their own Halloween materials out for retail sale in drugstores all over America. They also made masks and paper costumes. This was a first. It was the first time that costumes were specifically made and marketed for Halloween. Before that, costumes had all been homemade. When I was a kid, it wasn't a Halloween outfits like you wear now. So basically, you wore your overalls or your jeans or sloppy clothes. 
but she didn't go downtown and buy a special outfit just for Halloween. Just anything, you know, to make yourself a little conspicuous. Paper costumes were fancy and an improvement on the homemade variety, but they had their drawbacks. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of that paper was flammable, and I was surprised at how many newspaper clippings I came across of costumes catching fire. Soon, other manufacturers looking to tap into the kid market for Halloween costumes began making more durable disguises. Sears first box costumes came around 1930 and then it, it went from there and the costumes came off of radio show characters and the funny papers. Costumes for parties, costumes for wild town-wide parties and for school parties and church parties. Halloween was a big social occasion. Halloween parades also helped drag the holiday out from the shadows and into the public arena. Allentown, Pennsylvania may have had the first parade in 1905, but others soon followed. Tom's River, New Jersey in 1919. Anoka, Minnesota in 1920. Anoka has held its parade every year since. In fact, the city now bills itself the Halloween capital of the world. Each of these local efforts to tame Halloween worked to some extent. But what Halloween really needed was a whole new tradition. And it would soon get one. But this new tradition would prove to be a variation on a very old Halloween theme. phrase still triggers cascades of candy into plastic pumpkins and pillowcases across America on the night of October 31st. And though the custom goes back centuries, the phrase trick-or-treat is probably less than a hundred years old. Trick-or-treat is amazingly new. People think trick-or-treat goes back for centuries, and it doesn't. Trick-or-treat is actually less than 80 years old, probably. Um, the term derives from pranking that was very widespread and destructive in America in the 20th century. And at some point, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of buying off these pranksters. Homeowners bribed rowdy kids with homemade treats, such as popcorn balls and candy apples, to avoid getting pranked or tricked. In 1939, the phrase and the custom turned up in print. Doris Hudson Moss published an article in American Home Magazine that talked about the success she had having a Halloween open house for the kids in her neighborhood. She didn't get tricked. She gave them sweets. It all worked. With the new custom came new treats. Not so much homemade goodies like popcorn balls, now kids got store-bought pre-packaged candies, Mars bars, Reese's cups, and good old Hershey's chocolate. Candy finally killed the rowdy Halloween. And now the time was right for the reinvented holiday to get Hollywood. <laughs> a pop culture phenomenon, a national festival attended by millions, celebrating the joys of scavenging for mass-produced candy. I loved Halloween when I was a kid. I participated in it. I loved the rituals of it. I loved the pranks of it. I loved the mischief of it. I loved going to houses and dressing up and getting candy, and then there were parties, and it was just fantastic. Then in 1966, Halloween found a home where all pop culture ultimately goes. TV. Halloween's stature zoomed off the charts when America went trick-or-treating with Charlie Brown. The whole idea of the Great Pumpkin, of course, came from the comic strip when Sparky Schultz decided that it would be very funny if one of the kids got his holidays mixed up. And uh, so that's how Linus ends up in the pumpkin patch every year. 
Who are you writing to, Linus? This is the time of year to write to the great pumpkin. On Halloween night, the great pumpkin rises out of his pumpkin patch and flies through the air with his bag of toys for all the children. You must be crazy. When are you going to stop believing in something that isn't true? When you stop believing in that fellow with the red suit and the white beard. Television and America's most popular comic strip had given Halloween its unofficial seal of approval. The holiday had never in its entire history been so mainstream. But Halloween-themed cartoons aimed at kids were one thing. A movie for adults with Halloween as its theme was another. Nobody had ever tried it before. That is, until director John Carpenter took a stab at it in 1978 with the classic Halloween. The idea of recalling my film Halloween came from the distributor. And when he said it, I thought, well, you know, he's right, absolutely right. There's never been really a Halloween-themed film. It's one of those eye-openers. Wow, why didn't I think of that years ago? What a great idea. Carpenter's $325,000 film would spawn a franchise grossing more than $500 million. It broke new ground, elevating the horror film from B-movie status to respected genre. And completely by accident, the film would also redefine our attitudes about Halloween masks. It started when the wardrobe budget forced the crew to create a mask for the villain, Michael Myers, for next to nothing. The production designer ran up to Burt Wheeler's magic shop on Hollywood Boulevard and bought this Captain Kirk from Star Trek mask, which didn't look anything like William Shatner, just looked this strange face, elongated face. But it was spray painted and, and, and fixed up a little bit. It was distorted, which is perfect. It's kind of written that way in the script, as wearing a face. The bargain basement mask and the villain behind it soon became another Halloween icon. Michael Myers still, even though the, the original movie came out in 1978, it still remains uh, one of the most popular Halloween characters of all time. This idea of the mask of stalker menacing young people at Halloween, it shifted the focus of Halloween away from ghosts and goblins to uh, human villainy. But this nondescript mask did much more than that. It helped to redefine the limits of what a Halloween mask could be. And it ushered in a new face of Halloween. One for a new millennium. For hundreds of years, masks and costumes have been a way for partiers to disguise themselves. And now, it's a multi-million dollar business. One Halloween-themed store, Burbank, California's Halloween Town, is so popular, it's open 12 months of the year, satisfying customers' need for disguise. We've had this business for 10 years now, and we really wanted to make it special, so we decided to open a year-round permanent store with ultimate spooky shopping environment. It really puts people in the mood to shop for Halloween. Halloween stuff is all over the store, but the heart of Halloween Town's business is masks. We have dozens of masks. We have the best zombies you can find, the best clowns. Masks and disguises have always been great ways to uh, let you off the hook in terms of your behavior. Then acting out kind of holiday like Halloween, of course, it's uh, perfect. When I was a kid, I loved masks, but usually all you could find at the local stores were crappy, plastic, flimsy masks that lost their shape. But as time went on, they've really evolved into an art form to where there's a lot of time spent in the sculpting and the painting. And now it's to the point where you can get an expensive, high-end mask that almost rivals movie quality. And Wayne Toth would know. He's a special effects artist for major motion pictures. We have a lot of customers that like higher-end stuff or high-quality stuff, so we go out of our way to get that. We have high-end costumes, fancy jackets, and all kinds of accessories you really couldn't find anywhere else. We try and make it so no matter what you're looking for, you can find it here. Today's upscale masks and costumes are a far cry from the generic devils, witches, skeletons, and ghosts of the 1960s. But that's the decade when the Halloween wardrobe began to change. 
Hollywood started to influence what kids wore, transforming them into their favorite TV and movie characters. Today, that trend has escalated to an obsession. Film franchises like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, and Halloween are inspiring growing legions of kids to dress to kill. To wear the mask of the killer or of the ghost, of the skeleton, it gives a kid a sense of a lot of power and also of safety. Because the monster can't get you if you are the monster for that moment. Crazed killer masks are just part of Halloween's evolving taste in costumes. The only rule now is that there are no rules. Masks take their inspiration from pop culture, religion, politics, you name it. And a growing number of faces behind them belongs not to kids, but adults. Halloween has become a huge adult activity, and I, and I don't think that was uh, the case, say, 50, 60 years ago. But it's been, again, specific days set aside where you can be somebody that you normally aren't. Uh, you can get behind a mask, you can wear clothes you would never wear during the rest of the year, uh, and people enjoy these. Truth is, our 21st century Halloween is as much a holiday for adults as it is a holiday for kids. You get those children who are now growing up, and they become very nostalgic for Halloween. So Halloween shifts again, starts to become more of an adult holiday. Halloween businesses now cater to anyone who wants to get into the spirit of the holiday. <laughs> with parties and Halloween-themed venues such as haunted houses. 50 years ago, when you were too old to trick-or-treat, you probably had to stay home and hand out candy. There was nothing else for you to do. Now there is a vast and imaginative haunted house industry just for you. And there's something like 4,000 haunted houses in the United States every year. I loved haunted houses. They fascinated me. They terrified me as a kid. But haunted houses aren't the only place to find adults getting out on Halloween. In places like New York City's Greenwich Village Halloween Parade and West Hollywood's Halloween Carnival, the holiday takes a walk on the wild and naughty side. Of course, the gay Halloween parade is now a big fixture in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and of course a big part of the New York celebration. But it's this idea of turning the world on its head and being who you aren't or would like to be. Again, it's that mercurial American obsession with self-transformation. And that's the thing, I think, that really ignited Halloween in America. This sexually liberated Halloween sometimes crosses the line from adults to adults only. If you look at the costumes that are sold to adults these days, the costumes for women are all kind of borderline prostitute costumes. You know, the sexy nurse, the sexy maid, the sexy anything. Now, grown-ups are taking it one step further. They stock up on specially packaged Halloween novelty candy and join their children going door to door on Halloween night. These trick-or-treaters of the 1970s and 80s now seize the opportunity to relive their childhood Halloweens, dressing in full costume, supposedly to keep a watchful eye on their kids. And just as Halloween has scared kids for years, Halloween scares parents too. They fear sending their kids out unsupervised into a hostile world, full of poisoned candy and razor blade riddled apples. But they really shouldn't be. I grew up hearing about razor blades and apples myself, and it's clearly what we would call a contemporary legend. Uh, another term is urban legend. There's a great societal unease about this idea that we're telling our kids to go take candy from strangers. So there's a lot of stories about razor blades and candied apples and, and these sorts of things. Uh, and parents every year get very, very worried about it. Did razor blades and apples ever happen? Uh, I believe there are a couple of cases, but of course you can ask which came first, you know, the story or the actions. Razor blades in apples, jack-o'-lanterns, soul cakes. They make up the legends, the texture of the Halloween we know. Today, Halloween wears many masks. It's a day for adults to push their boundaries a little. Clearly, a lot of women want to have a very sexy side of them, and it's only on Halloween that they bring it out. Maybe, you know, they could do a little more often. 
Yet Halloween still remains the domain of kids. When you're a kid, you had one night a year where you were in charge. You got to dress up. You got to be something that you usually weren't. And you kind of even got paid for the privilege of this. It was an amazing holiday. Halloween doesn't like to have its energies tamed. You know, it's uh, the rebellious aspect's going to pop up somewhere. Look close enough, and you'll see that Halloween is a showcase of everything the human race fears. Through the centuries, we've learned to live with what scares us most. And now, on October 31st, we turn our fears into fire. So beware of haunted houses and creaking doors, billowing sheets and full moons. And don't be surprised if a smiling jack-o'-lantern wishes you Happy Halloween.